Iran has developed their own unique way of war that we're watching play out right now all across the Middle East. The United States says that the Houthi attacks into the Red Sea are not at all connected to the war in Gaza, which is just wrong. And Netanyahu says that 70% of Hamas's battalions have so far been destroyed. We're going to take that with a grain of salt, so let's get into it. I'm recording this at 9 a.m. Central on Tuesday, February 6, 2024. So Adam Roussel writing our newest piece in Substack, uh, titled, quote, Beware Iran's Military Industrial Complex, How Tehran is Changing the Nature of Asymmetric Warfare. And in this, he argues that Iran has spent decades developing the kind of technologies it needs to wage asymmetric war across the region, and we're just now starting to see this really play out. So we've talked on this channel before how, and I know this is a little controversial, I said we're at war, like it or not. We are at war, the war just happens to be on Iran's terms, and this is kind of talking to that in a way. So what Adam gets at in this piece is that Tehran understands, and this shouldn't be a shock to anybody, that they can't win a conventional war with regional powers, let alone the United States. So in turn, over the past few decades, what they've been developing is a defense industry, a general strategy designed to inflict maximum damage in any sort of asymmetric type conflict. That is what is happening in the Middle East right now. It's been happening for a long time. It's kind of highlighted with the recent tensions. So one of the things, I think this is a great example that kind of summarizes the overall Iranian strategy, the Shahed 136 drone. Adam gets into the specifications, like a 2,000 kilometer range, right? These things cost like $20,000 a piece, which sounds expensive, but in military terms, that is incredibly cheap. Most long range missiles with this kind of range are over a million dollars. So think about that. It's just a fraction of the cost. And what Iran has done is ex they've exported these to friendly countries. So uh, there were some that were sold to Russia, for instance. They were using Iranian-made drones. Over time, they kind of exported the design and manufactured that to Russia, and Russia started using their Garan-style drone. It's the Shahed, just manufactured in Russia uh, with Russian parts rather than Iranian. They have also exported these, and this is the big change. They have exported these to non-state actors because they're so cheap. You know, Kataib Hezbollah, Hezbollah uh, the Houthis, they can all afford to $20,000 drones when they can't afford multi-million dollar missiles necessarily. So what he says is, quote, these weapons have allowed relatively weak non-state actors the ability to punch well above their weight, inflicting serious damage in the region while shutting down much of the traffic on one of the world's key sea lanes. In this way, Iranian drones have brought about a new phase in global asymmetrical warfare. And what he says, and kind of wrapping up here, is that by Iran exporting these technologies and these weapon systems to non-state actors all across the region, they've given a substantial leg up to these non-state actors that have traditionally been relatively disadvantaged in their fights with, say, the United States, Israel, or others. This is just starting to play out now. These proxies aren't new. Iran's strategy across the Middle East isn't new. But these low-cost weapons... Uh, like the Shahed, that are easily exported and easily developed in some of these countries, gives these proxies a significant capability that they just didn't have even a few years prior. But again, if interested in more detail on this piece, uh, the article is up for free on Substack right now. I'll put the link in the description below. Then turning down to Yemen, where the Houthis in U.S. continue to exchange strikes. Uh, on February 4th, U.S. Central Command said that they conducted a, a strike in self-defense against a Houthi land attack cruise missile and four anti-ship cruise missiles, all which were prepared to launch against ships in the Red Sea. Then, uh, then yesterday, on February 5th, U.S. Central Command said they conducted another self-defense strike against a Houthi uh, explosive uncrewed surface vessel, USV. So we've only seen a couple of these so far, but now adding to the Houthi arsenal, they have launched uh, one-way attack drones, suicide-type drones, uh, missiles, anti-ship missiles, and now we're seeing more and more of these uncrewed surface vessels. Uh, the Houthis then, for their part, said that the naval forces of the Yemeni armed forces carried out two military operations in the Red Sea, the first targeting an American ship and the other targeting a British ship. Both ships were targeted with appropriate naval missiles and the hits were accurate and direct thanks to God. Little bit of information coming out from the U.S. and British on that. Not a lot. It sounds like one of those ships, it sounds like those attacks did take place, for what it's worth. Uh, one of the ships reported slight damage. It, the, there was impact on the ship, uh, continuing on course, no injuries reported. And then the other one said that there was an explosion about 50 meters away from the ship. So it sounds like one of these two struck home. Both ships are continuing on their course. Then there was a press briefing talking about the Houthis a couple days ago that's just 
so frustrating. And I think it's one of those things where all of you watching this are going to say, yeah, we knew that. But then you see these, you know, official government figures putting out different information. It's so frustrating. I feel like the, the picture is being blurred of what is actually happening across the region. So a reporter in a uh, press briefing asked, quote, at what point would the administration consider this to be at least a small regional war? NSC spokesperson John Kirby responded saying, quote, yeah, I absolutely do not agree with your description of a same larger conflict. There's a conflict going on between Israel and Hamas. There were attacks against our troops and facilities in Iraq and Syria well before the 7th of October, certainly in the last administration as well. That is true. The attacks across the Middle East are not new. They've been happening for a long time. They have definitely increased, substantially increased since October 7th. You can't deny that. Uh, he says, uh, Kirby continues saying, and as for the Houthis, they can claim all they want that this is linked to Gaza, but two thirds of the ships that they're hitting have no connection to Israel whatsoever. So it's not, it's just not true. It's a falsehood, end quote. This is not accurate. This is not presenting what is happening down there uh, in, in the correct manner, in my opinion. I mean, you just have to look at what the Houthis are saying, right? So they, in, in these most recent attacks, they carried out against U.S. and British ships yesterday and the day prior, they said, quote, the Yemeni armed forces emphasize the continuation of their military operations in the Red and Arab Bahrain against Israeli shipping or those heading to the ports of occupied Palestine until the siege is lifted and the aggression against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip is stopped. Every single one of their statements talks about how they are doing this because of the war in Gaza. So you might, I understand the argument that you, and I fall in this camp where it's not everything. There's more to it than just the war in Gaza. But if you, if you look back at the, the sample of evidence that we have at this point, these attacks really were not taking place before the war kicked off. These all started about in November. Uh, the Houthis have, have long been a menace in the region, right? Not to, to write that away. But these attacks against international shipping spiked in November. And every single one of them, the Houthis say it is because of what is happening in Gaza. You might not believe them, but then we got to find some other kind of evidence to support why they're doing this. The other part here is when you look at the ceasefire, the six or seven day ceasefire that took place between Israel and Hamas, most entities stopped their fighting at that point. There was one possible violation by the Houthis, even though they weren't a party to that, where a surveillance drone was shot down as it approached U.S. ships. So, you know, 50-50, but either way, that was a six or seven day stretch. The only, that I believe, six or seven day stretch since these attacks started where the Houthis have not attacked commercial shipping. So to look at all of this and what the Houthis are doing and take their statements and then say it is not connected to Gaza, I think that's just not accurate at all. You could say that Gaza is playing a part and there's a bigger picture at play, but then I think it's on... Uh, uh, John Kirby here in the U.S. government to, to put out more information about what why else are the Houthis doing this. Because everything they're saying is that it's because of Gaza. So we if we have other information or believe that there is something else driving this, more than the sole reason that the Houthis are saying, we got to put that forward. Uh, otherwise, again, my opinion, that statement was just, just not accurate at all. Uh, but sticking with the Houthis, their leader, Abdul Malik Badr al-Din al-Houthi, put out a statement yesterday kind of giving you an idea of how they view this conflict, right? So he said, quote, the American attack is absolute evil in every sense of the word. The Americans and the British are the arms of the octopus of evil, injustice and tyranny, the Jewish lobby that carries the banner of Satan. So not, you know, not big fans of ours, not big fans of Israel uh, or the UK, Nothing really new there. This speech has really ramped up since the U.S. has started. U.S. and U.K. have started carrying out strikes inside of Yemen in the last couple of weeks. They say we set out to confront America, Israel, and Britain, the evil trio. I don't know if that nickname is going to stick, like Axis of Jihad, evil trio. I just don't think the U.S., Israel, and Britain are going to going to cling to that one. They say, "quote We are in a holy battle, the battle of the promised conquest and the holy jihad, ready to make sacrifices, confident of victory and the promise of God Almighty." I warn them and say that they must stop their aggression against Gaza and stop their siege. Otherwise, we will seek to escalate more and more. So again, Houthis, not a big fan of the United States, uh, UK, really don't like Israel. But most of their comments now are really, you know, they, they do call out in this speech a little bit more than in the past, U.S. policies in the region, U.S. support of Israel, things like that. Most of their talking points center around what's happening in Gaza right now. They're starting to expand that a little bit as the U.S., U.K., and other allied nations have started to take military action 
against Houthi targets in Yemen. But for the most part, it's all the reason they're doing this. What they always come back to, what they always come back to is the ongoing war in Gaza. So I've said it before, we'll see if that war were to stop tomorrow, if a permanent ceasefire was reached tomorrow. I don't know that the Houthis would automatically stop. It's definitely connected. I don't know if it's 100% of the reason that they're doing what they're doing. Of course, I don't know that that's really on the table because it doesn't seem like the war in Gaza is going to be stopping anytime soon. Uh, on that note, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had a meeting with his cabinet earlier this week where he said, quote, to date, we have destroyed 17 out of 24 Hamas battalions. That is 70%. He said most of the remaining battalions are in the south of the Gaza Strip and in Rafah, and we will take care of them as well. Second, cleansing operations are required after the battalions are disbanded, as our forces are doing with determination and very aggressive raids in the north of the Gaza Strip and in its center. I feel like maybe clearing would have been a better term. Just in the context of how this war is playing out, I feel like neither side wants to ever have to use the term cleansing. I feel like that's, that's uh, prime to be taken out of context, right? He says, thirdly, the neutralization of the underground tunnels is required, as our forces are systematically doing in Khan Yunus and are doing in all parts of the Strip, and this requires more time. We will not end the war before we complete all of its goals. The elimination of Hamas, the return of all of our abductees, and a promise that Gaza will no longer pose a threat to Israel. This comes amidst uh, reports that the IDF raided a building in Khan Yunus belonging to the local Hamas commander there, and then in the north... Again, we continue to see more and more reports of Israel and Hamas fighting in the northern portion of the Gaza Strip. Uh, Israel says over the past 24 hours they were able to eliminate seven Hamas terrorists and firefights there. So we definitely should take this 70% uh, destroyed number with a grain of salt. It's just historically, we people are really bad at estimating enemy killed in action during the course of an active war. The U.S. in Vietnam is just a great example how those numbers were just incredibly inflated over time and did not reflect the reality on the ground, not by a lot. But you know, even if you look at a recent example, the ongoing war in Ukraine, that should be, of all things, should be relatively easy to gauge total enemy losses. But they are all over the place. Like They vary by tens, even hundreds of thousands in opposite directions, which is crazy because the vast majority of the casualties in that war are uniformed soldiers. Right? There, there, there have been civilian casualties, 100%. But the majority of the fighting, especially right now, is taking place along the front where there are troops in trenches and dugout positions. They're being assaulted with tanks and armored personnel carriers with helicopters overhead. There's artillery pieces firing at other artillery pieces. Those are military forces. And even with that and the, the crazy amount of drone coverage overhead, with all of those eyes of the battlefield, the casualty numbers are just crazy off in different directions. When you look then at the nature of the fighting in Gaza, I, I can't. I don't know how Israel is is you know assigns any level of confidence to their casualty estimates when it comes to singling out Hamas. The reason for that is first off, again, very hard even in a conventional war to understand how many enemy have been killed or wounded. We just always mess that up. But when you layer on the urban warfare, con, the, the, na the nature of urban warfare, the tunnel networks to where how many times has Israel dropped a bomb and it collapses in a tunnel? Was there a squad of 10 Hamas militants down there or one or zero? Right? How many times does that play out before you don't know? Or did that tunnel not collapse? And that, that squad of 10 Hamas militants that you said was destroyed or you think was destroyed was safely in another, another portion of the tunnel completely unhampered by that airstrike. Then when you layer in the civilian component here, and I'm not talking about you know, confusing women or children with Hamas militants, but what about the military-aged male who was not a part of Hamas three months ago, four months ago, five months ago, but now is moving weapons for them from one location to another sometimes, but not all the time. Like where do they factor into that, right? I have a feeling that those are being included in the Hamas figures, but they're not wearing a uniform, right? That makes it even harder. And in a lot of cases, and this is something that we saw in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Vietnam as well, any sort of irregular warfare, you're going to see situations where when militants fall, their buddies will maybe not recover the body, but recover the weapons. So then when friendly forces come up on that location, what they see is two or three dead people in civilian clothing. And you then have to find a way to prove that these were militants, that they're the ones shooting at you and not just civilians that were killed. And of course, you can't forget that Hamas is not announcing any of their militant deaths. So again, 
what we have from Netanyahu here is saying that 70% of the Hamas battalions have so far been destroyed. I, I'm not even going to fathom a guess at what that number is. Hamas has certainly been degraded. A lot of Hamas militants have certainly been killed, no doubt. Uh, 70% feels a little bit high, but uh, time will tell, I suppose. The ceasefire talks are still ongoing, supposedly. There's been a lot of rumors about, uh, you know, at one point there was a story coming out that Hamas had denied, declined all of the, shot down the uh, ceasefire proposal. They then came out and said, we haven't, wait for more information to come out. Nothing has really come out on that front. The, so in turn, no ceasefires in place. But I'll tell you what, just, just seeing some of the statements coming out from Israel, it's hard to see where is the middle ground for this ceasefire. Because Israel continues to, to hold tight to their, Netanyahu calls it out right here, we will not end the war before we complete all of our goals. The elimination of Hamas, the return of all of our abductees, and a promise that Gaza will no longer pose a threat to Israel. When you look at some of the terms that have been presented in these recent ceasefire negotiations, it's things like a six-month ceasefire, or Israel leaves Gaza entirely, or the women and elderly are released. Like, I just, it feels very much at odds with the statements that Netanyahu and other Israeli officials continue to put out. So we will wait. Maybe there's news coming out. Maybe by the time this video comes out, there'll be a ceasefire announced. I'm not optimistic. While it's a good thing that those talks are ongoing, it does seem more and more like the two sides are kind of digging in, uh, not willing to necessarily meet in the middle to take some of their stated objectives off the table for a temporary truce. Again, personal opinion there. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out the Substack linked in the description below. The opening article I talked about today was our newest piece, Iran, their uh, military industrial complex, and kind of how they are waging their type of war. The idea here, like I think that piece did, is we've brought people on board to write these articles that are complementary to the topics I'm talking about in these videos. So hopefully you watch the video, you can go read that piece. Uh, it's email, it's free, comes direct to your inbox if interested. Uh, and you can get a little better idea, a little broader perspective of how this and other conflicts are playing out all around the world. But thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.